Uh, this is an exciting opportunity for both a practicing physiotherapist as well as uh, graduating or master's level students in musculoskeletal medicine uh, to get a comprehensive hands-on workshop. Uh, to register for the course, uh, easiest way is to just email us at alld.pune, P-U-N-E, at gmail.com. Uh, once again, uh, uh, it's an exciting opportunity uh, of hands-on course uh, all day long, four days with post-test, uh, and I hope to uh, see you all there. Thank you. Uh, good, good morning uh, if the, for viewers in the United States and uh, good uh, evening uh, in India. Uh, my name is uh, Anil Bhave. I am uh, uh, working in Sinai Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland in the United States. And uh, today uh, we are going to speak on an interesting topic which has become a bigger issue in our lives the osteoarthritis of the knee joint. It's always been around, but it's, it, its significance has risen as uh, we have a greater aging population and a population that is get, becoming more sedentary. And our job as physical therapist has to be defined uh, in, this, uh, in this world. What are we going to do? How are we going to treat these patients? These patients are now, Osteoarthritis of the hip and knee was the 18th disease in the overall disease management 25 years ago. Today, it has risen to number seven uh, in terms of uh, disease, chronic disease. And by 2030, the disease will reach to number four. And the expected number of total knee replacements just in the United States are going to cross 1 million people every year. And for India, it could reach easily 5 million people if everybody went for a total knee replacement. So the question is, how do we change that? How do we change a paradigm? And how do we make it so that their patients have other options? And our therapist friends have more options looking at both biomechanics, physiology, role of manual therapy, what activities one should do and what are the other linking mechanisms in the joint? So now I would like to uh, invite Dr. Deepak Kumar uh, from uh, New Delhi, India. And I have met Deepak many times. I call him Deepak, he's my friend, but he's really traditionally Deepak, Dr. Deepak Kumar. He does not need much introduction. Uh, he is very famous in India, and actually he does uh, courses both in India as well as internationally. And one day I'm going to host him in my hospital to teach my therapist. So uh, it's, uh, it's my great pleasure to invite him to this uh, 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 webinar. And uh, Deepak is going to discuss about manual therapy. And I have, a, I have a saying in my department is that there are lots of studies done in physical therapy. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, we believe in evidence-based science. Uh, and for the knee joint specifically, uh, the only thing that has enough abundant controlled trials are only two modalities in physical therapy. One is manual therapy and one is NMES, neuromuscular stimulation. Everything else, there are one, two, three studies here and there, but only these two modalities have a very strong evidence behind them. So I have asked Deepak to actually demonstrate some of the techniques that, that those are his go-to or favorite techniques. And he teaches many, many more techniques. So my point here is not just to talk about three techniques that are the only techniques he uses, but what I want him to share is how he does them. And then in the panel discussions, we will have questions for him about the other techniques and other things that he does to manage a very large number of patient population that he manages in his private clinic. So over to Deepa. Thank you, Dr. Anil. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity to interact with my fellow colleagues. And thank you, Joe, for a lovely presentation. It was really very impressive. And I'll take my presentation from here onwards. Like the very first slide, Joe showed that when the person is walking, they don't extend their knee fully. 
15 day or 20 degree or 23 degree flexion is still there because they are not extending the knee over the time. This is what we have experienced and seen repeatedly on many patients in India. Eventually, they develop fixed flexion deformity, FFD, 5 to 10 degree FFD. And why they are not doing this extent? Because they are not doing this extension, the patella get rubbed more. And it is the fat pad that irritates a lot. And as we all know, how do you check fat pad irritation by asking patient to do the extension? And if the extension is painful, that definitely it is a fat pad irritation in the terminal extension. So I'm going to show you certain techniques which will help you in aligning that patella and as well as gaining the end range of flexion as well as end range of extension. As uh, I attended one of the seminar by Dr. Anil Bhave in Mumbai, and there I realized, uh, and he also demonstrated, if you are bending the knee fully, that is the time your knee is getting best nutrition, not by 90 degree, but maximum knee flexion is required. And since then, we are advising patient to go for maximum knee flexion. So I'm going to show you technique how to gain maximum knee flexion in a pain-free way so i'm going to show you the how to treat uh, fat pad irritation because of the mal mal alignment of patella and then how to adjust internal dearrangement of the knee like in the end of the discussion dr anil and joe was discussing about the internal dearrangement uh, cartilage erosion or the surgery so if someone comes with that cartilage erosion, yes, even I prefer not to send them for surgery, but to try to treat them with the help of manual therapy. So luckily my presentation is going in the same direction. I have selected uh, those four or five techniques and time allocated for me is 12 minutes and I'll try to finish before that. So let me start my presentation now. I'm going to show you a few videos. And if there's any question, you can ask me. You check the condition of the lateral retinoculum by putting your fingers there. And if you are able to feel the good gap there. So first of all, you need to assess the malpositioning of the patella. It could be tilted. It could be shifted. It could be rotated. And based on that, you are going to do this manual therapy technique. So first, of course, you have to do assessment before doing any manual therapy technique but no gap there. That means it is slightly tilted and shifted. Also means that the lateral retinoculum is tight. So do a gentle massage. So you treat the patient in different ranges for releasing the retinoculum, like in fully extended position, and then you keep in slightly flexed position, and then you can keep the pillow or towel. And then again, you do the gentle massage on the lateral side to release the retinoculum. Same way, you will do it in 90 degree flex position also. Once you release the lateral retinoculum, it's a good idea to mobilize the patella from medial to lateral and then from lateral to medial in order to mobilize. Okay, so in this, sometimes the physio, they do mistake. They do the deep friction massage. I'm not talking about deep friction massage here. It's a very gentle massage because if you do little extra pressure instead of relieving pain instead of relieving the releasing the lateral retinoculum you may irritate the fat pad around the patella and that may give pain to the patient so make sure you do it very very gently it's okay to take more number of days but do not over treat your patient and here is the technique how do you treat patient with if there is any meniscal injury or any internal derangement i have Trim down my video so that I can finish it within prescribed time. But I'm sure the, you will get the clear yeah. message. And then gently rotate internally and ask patient, is that comfortable? Yes. And if it is comfortable, I ask them to bend the knee or make it straight. Again, bend the knee and make it straight. If you don't want to bend the knee, if you just want to do the passive exercise, so grab it there and simply rotate it in this way. This can also be done with the help of assistant and then you are able to apply the traction also if your assistant is there to help you with this technique. 
So in case you want to do the same glide along with the traction, you will need one therapist to help you or if the patient is intelligent enough, you can take the help of the patient himself by asking him to hold the leg from here and then you can do it. But in case because of any X, Y, Z reason, patient is not able to do, then you take the help of fellow physio and your friend can grab it strongly and then you go to the just above the ankle joint, grab the medial and lateral medullus and give a traction to the knee joint. So along with the traction, you can go for the internal rotation. While maintaining the internal rotation, you can go for flexion or back to 90 degrees. I have a very interesting story about this technique. One of my trustee in the previous hospital, he got locked knee and he was 55 at that time. And nobody could help him. And when he approached the physiotherapy department, because he was the one of the director in the hospital, even I was very apprehensive, how do I help him? And I don't know, somehow probably I was happened to be lucky. And this is the technique I tried as a first technique on his knee joint. And within uh, less than a minute, I could uh, adjust his knee joint and he was walking without pain then and there. And that day I got extension of the physiotherapy department. It was in 500 square feet area and they approved it for 2000 square feet area on the very next day. So I remember this technique. This is a beautiful technique for adjusting the internal derangement of the knee joint. Flexion or back to 90 degrees. Or if you can reduce the height of the plank, then you can also go for full extension. So in that case, I will go for the traction again and then the internal rotation and go for the extension. Now, because the height of the table, I'm not able to go full extent into extension, but if the height was less, I could easily achieve good extension like that. So I'm sustaining my glide as well as the traction and I'm doing it. Now, next technique I'm going to show you is the technique for gaining and range flexion. As I said, this is what I learned from Dr. Anil Bhave, that and range flexion is very, very important. In India, we usually believe and we have been advising not to bend knee above 90 degree or not to sit cross leg sitting on the floor because that will give pain to the patient. And I realized after attending the lecture of Dr. Anil Bhav in Mumbai that and range flexion, yes, do help our patient. And many times I do get knee pain. And when I bend my knee to full 135 degree, even my knee pain goes off. So now this is another technique, how to gain and range flexion. And it is a must now. Patient has a right to sit cross leg sitting on the floor until unless he or she is having very severe OA knee. So this is how we'll gain the and range flexion with the help of manual therapy. You can put the patient in level and range. And in order to give the passive operation, you will also need a belt to wrap around the ankle of the patient. So I will make a figure of eight around the ankle of the patient and then lock it there, give it in the hand of the patient, which he can pull comfortably. So I take it in the hand range and then I put heel of my hand on the tibial tuberosity. With one hand, I'm going to stabilize the femur and the other hand is going on the tibial velocity of the tibia. And this is how the treatment plane is. So where my forearm angle will be? Absolutely in the same way. So I'm going to put my forearm angle like that. And when he's going to bend the knee, the treatment plane will change from this angle to this angle. So my forearm angle also will change. So let me stabilize it and then I'm giving the posterior glide. Again, remember, I'm putting it on the tibial tuberosity, not on patella tendon. So you are not going to rub the patella tendon and avoiding irritation or the inflammation of the fat pad. So giving that glide and then asking patient to bend the knee if it is comfortable. Orange color arrow is the and dynamic band, stabilization band. while the See, green one is the direction of the glide. Down. Now extend your knee. And, and in change. any of my these five videos, you if you see red color arrow, and that I'm is a static stabilization. 
okay, while the patient is bending the knee passively so that there is no compressive forces over the joint and the glide is sustained throughout. And if you don't want to give the sustained glide and make patient move his affected joint, you can do the passive accessory glide in available end range. So imagine if the available end range is this. Now you go there and then simply do the now that's a static stabilization. Translation. Okay, and this is the second last video. Uh, this is the video what uh, Joe sh showed you the uh, problem that patients are not able to extend. Either they are having the pain or because of the weak muscle or because of the FFD. This is what my preferred technique for getting end range extension. So it's a beautiful technique. You must pay good attention so to this. So the very first thing we are going to do with the hand now. And if you want to do with the hand, maybe you need a block or a pillow to be placed under the heel so that it is raised a little bit. And suppose this is the available end range and if the extension is limited. So you want to do the anterior glide, one hand goes just behind the tibia and one hand goes just in front of the femur. Now, make sure when you're putting your hand on the femur, your hand is not on the patella. It has to be above patella, otherwise you may compress it and produce fat pad irritation. So go there and then because fat pad has glide and do the oscillation. Alternatively, you can also block it there with the help of some blocking and then push the femur backward and automatically you get the anterior glide. This can be used as self-treatment sure at home. Make the angle is correct of your block and it is just below the joint line and then you can do the anterior glide very comfortably without straining yourself. Now how to do the same thing with the help of belt now because as I discussed earlier with belt you save energy and you can apply greater amount of force in case your patient is larger than you. So I put the bar there. Again, make sure it is close to joint line. So bar goes there and you're looking towards the face of the patient. So the bar fall straight because this is the anterior glide you're doing and your shoulder should come on the knee joint there so that you are doing just the anterior glide now stabilize with the hand and with the belt you can give the accessory movement or you can sustain the glide in case you want to sustain and move the limb passively. So check the angle, give the glide and then push it down and then back and then push it down and then back and then push it down. Now in case it is not working, if it is still giving pain, you want to change the angle. Now it is anterior lateral glide and you can do the same thing or more lateral as compared to anterior. So find out which angle is working on the patient. Okay, and this is the last technique I'm going to show uh, before I complete my presentation because we have found if the osteoarthritis is mild to moderate, not very severe. And usually in India with the severe osteoarthritis, osteoarthritis, they usually go for total knee replacement. And before they go for total re knee replacement, they often visit physio. And if physiotherapist can help them, this is the technique going to help your patient for sure. I have already shown you how a physio do, but then you have to teach the self uh, treatment also, home management for the osteoarthritis knee. Majority of the time, as I told earlier, it is the internal rotation of the knee works. That could be because of some biomechanical alteration. Joe will probably, if required, may explain in greater detail. And because tibia is rotated either externally and you want to push it, put it back into medial rotation or some reason, or maybe the patella is too much out all majority of the time and you want to put it back. So that could be the reason why this technique works majority of the time. So you must teach the self-treatment to your patient to have long lasting result. And this is my last presentation, though there are many videos, but these are my favorite videos for managing the osteoarthritis of the you knee. Can, using the rotational glide, 
put the finger there and another hand there, rotate it inside and then rotate with the hand and maintain that glide and then you can go there. Or you can do the lateral glide if that was working. So take the foot out. And in case the internal is not working now, in some of the patient, the then you can try the lateral rotation also. And now do the same of Check out which one is working on the patient. So you According to the, the self-treatment to the patient. Okay, so these were the techniques I'll prefer to do on my patient along with, of course, along with other, other things like uh, standing exercise to the vastus medialis, uh, electrical stimulation. We preferably use uh, Russian stimulation for building up the muscles and then the biomechanical correction of the foot and all the ergonomic advice also. So this is what we will do along with the manual therapy. With this, thank you very much. I'm happy to take question if there is any. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deepak. Uh, that was wonderful presentation of uh, simple techniques that are not that simple, actually. They are complex maneuvers. And it's very important when does manual therapy, uh, one must uh, do it correctly and apply forces exactly where you need to be. I, the word that comes to my mind for manual therapy is called controlled aggression. Absolutely beautiful. It's a controlled aggression. Uh, and I learned that from, uh, I don't, I forget where I learned it from, but manual therapy is all about controlled aggression. And I like the use of belt, especially I use it a lot as I get older, it's harder for me to apply force through my hands, but also it, you can apply greater force. And I like your comment about you can apply greater force. And most therapists, in my opinion, are scared to apply force. And it's important that we understand, we did a simple measurement of what does it take to bend the knee when the knee is stiff? How much force do we need to apply? So what we found is you at least need to apply 25 to 35 kilograms of force at the ankle joint to even start having an effective knee bending when the knee is stiff. So it's very important. After all, we are physical therapists. We, we need to be physical and we need to be strong. And many physicians are af af afraid of applying that much force. They yes. believe that it will break the ligaments or something. Correct, correct. And, uh, but the other, other point is also that you made, just, I really like, is you, can, you don't apply force like a dummy. You apply force like a very smart person. And that's what the training in manual therapy teaches you is that you don't just apply force. You apply force at a very strategic point for a strategic period of time and do the oscillation. So you need good training, you need good hands and you need to be not fearful of applying force. So I like all those points you made in your, your presentation. My question to you is, What's your average uh, treatment time when a patient comes, let's see patient has osteoarthritis of the knee, mild to moderate disease, has some flexion deficit, some extension deficit, some patellofemoral problems. How much time would that patient be with you, treat, you know, just for manual therapy part? What would you say, about half an hour, maybe? Uh, no, for, for manual therapy, it's approximately five to 10 minutes time, okay. that's it. Okay. And manual therapy we do after doing some hot fermentation. And I love doing ultrasonic or the long wave diathermy, not the short wave, long wave. And then once the joint is soft and supple, that take care of the little bit of inflammation. I do the manual therapy. And after that, they go for the standing exercise. So manual therapy effectively five to 10 minutes. 10 minutes. And then pre, before, ther before manual therapy, you brought up a very good point is you always prefer to use some kind of heating modality. Yes, to make it soft. And that is, you, you do that to just soften up the dense connective tissue so you can mobilize it better? Yes, and also the inflammation and pain gate mechanism, all those things are there additionally. So that's my personal experience also. I always use moist heat yes. as my standard pre-therapy. Pre we used to actually have a protocol where we would have patients come in and sit with the moist heat for 10, 15 minutes before they come to therapy session, like before they actually are on the table. So, so you find that useful also, that's very good. Uh, Joe, uh, can you join here this discussion about the rotation? I'm very curious uh, about uh, the, the, the flexion with external or internal rotation. We are always taught 
flexion with uh, interrotation, extension with extra, external rotation. So uh, Deepak is showing something a little different. It, can you uh, elaborate on that a little bit, if you can? Yeah, you know, I don't have a tremendous amount of experience with that, but what, you know, my experience with the patients has been, you know, let the patient's uh, kind of pain experience guide uh, guide your treatment. Yeah. And, you know, we may start off with saying, okay, we're going to do it externally rotating. And then you might find that patient doesn't work for it. And, and, you know, one of the things about NeoA is that it's different for everybody. You know, it's, it's not a, a singular diagnosis. So somebody might have medial compartment NeoA, but they have involvement of the lateral meniscus and, and lateral joint capsule. And that's uh, you know, where some of their pain is coming from. So, you know, I think as Dr. Kumar said, you know, let that patient guide, let that patient's symptoms and feedback guide what you're doing. And don't be so rigid in saying, you know, this is the only way I'm going to turn and bend. Let the patient tell you uh, kind of what's working and what's not. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Deepak again. And uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, we are going to move on uh, to our next speaker, uh, uh, our next speaker is uh, Sona uh, Sarma. Dr. Sarma is uh, associate professor. Sona uh, Kolke now. Sona Kolke, I'm sorry. Sona yeah. Kolke. Uh, uh, she's associate professor. I call her Sona. I call everybody by my first their first names. I don't even know their last names. But anyway. Uh, so Sona uh, uh, has, uh, I have known Sona for a long time. Uh, many, many years, actually, I did a workshop in uh, Ahmedabad many, many years ago, and she was the only one who finished the casting on time and not only did a cast for extension, but even finished a cast for flexion, which I had not even shown properly. So I've known Sona for a long time. She's uh, at Sancheti. She has spent time in Baltimore with us for a few weeks, and uh, she was very well liked by everybody in our department. And Sona worked on a very interesting topic, which is how do the hips matter in the knee problems? So Sona is going to share with us uh, that. Uh, and uh, uh, over to you, Sona. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. Yeah, it was a very enriching uh, kind of an experience in Baltimore at uh, Rubens Institute and working under Bhave, sir. So yes, that experience has helped me to change my outlook about the treatment. Uh, so yes, uh, my topic for today is all about the hips. And yes, we are still talking about knee OA. So let's get on. So why do hip muscles, especially the hip abductors, weaken in knee OA? So the reasons are plenty. Uh, we could just kind of get into the main ones. So basically, the hip abductors are designed to function with a neutral or a slightly adducted femur. And with genuarum, the femur gets placed in a more abducted position, which alters this length tension relationship of the hip abductors and reduces their peak torque. Also, which we have really noticed in many of our patients uh, with medial knee OA, frequently adopt an ipsilateral trunk lean to bring the ground reaction force closer to the knee joint and reduce the load. So, however, in the long run, uh, this reduces the demands on the hip abductor muscles and renders them weak. So we already know about the forces which are acting at the knee in the frontal plane, where we have a knee adduction moment, which is there even in neutral alignment, which increases the loads on the medial compartment. And with the varus knee, uh, the knee adduction moment increases because the ground reaction force moves further away from the center of the joint. And this increases the loads on the medial compartment many fold. So all strategies to reduce the knee adduction moment like this lateral trunk lean are going to be used by the patient. And uh, in the long run, this helps to delay the progression of the disease also. Uh, another reason is that most patients with progression of knee OA uh, are going to be having pain and uh, it kind of pushes them towards a more sedentary lifestyle. And uh, if you notice that reduces not only the strength, but it reflects a poor physical function as well as uh, reduces the gait speed and ultimately reflects in reducing the muscle power, not only of the ipsilateral uh, uh, involved limb, but also of the contralateral limb. 
so this is a beautiful study done by Alison Chang et al. Uh, on hip ab abduction moment and its protection against uh, medial uh, tibiofemoral OA progression. And uh, what they did basically was that they had 57 patients and they kind of measured them at baseline and uh, 18 months post, uh, 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 after 18 months again, for the hip abduction moment, which they thought is a protective against the knee abduction moment. And they also uh, repeated the x-rays. So this was actually based on an assumption that uh, the hip abductors, when they are weak, cause a contralateral pelvic drop, which moves the ground reaction force towards the swing limb, uh, or rather away from the stance knee joint and increases the knee abduction moment. So what they interestingly noticed was that the hip abduction moment of the non-progressing knees, that is the OAs which had not progressed, uh, were much stronger compared to the hip abduction moments in the knees which had worse progression of OA. In fact, they found the odds that uh, every unit, additional unit of in internal hip abduction moment reduces the knee OA odds by 50%. So that was a significant contribution. I just included this slide because we have our uh, uh, panelist who is the second author of this paper, but most of the studies which have been considered in this is already there in the meta-analysis that I'm going to talk on. So let's move on to that. Uh, so this is a paper from Jaws PT published in August 2016, and it was a systematic review with meta-analysis. And uh, it had basically searched all the major databases and uh, zeroed down after going through full text of 100 articles, 102 articles, only five were eligible, out of which three studied the isometric and two studied the isokinetic strength of the hip joints in patients with uh, knee OA. Uh, so there were a total of 237 knee OA subjects, which were compared with 140 healthy controls. And what they found was, uh, so these were the key points. So in the isometric strength, they found that the abductors had moderate evidence for deficits, whereas adductors, they found two studies to be contrasting, uh, that is the Hinman's and Yamada study, in which one showed that it was weaker and one showed that it was stronger. So because of the conflicting evidence, it was very low quality evidence. And even the other muscles just had one study, so there was limited evidence about their reduction. Uh, in isokinetic, only two studies were present, and when pooled, they show again a moderate evidence for reduction of abductors, whereas all the other muscles showed low to moderate evidence because only one study studied them in detail. That is a study by Costa et al. Uh, this was one more study which was recently published in 2019 in BMC Musculoskeletal Journal, and uh, this was interesting because, again, this tested the uh, about approximately 28 knee OA patients with 31 healthy controls, unilateral and bilateral knee were considered. And uh, they interestingly came up with something which is very contrasting. So I've marked in red about ipsilateral muscles which were weak of the hip. And I've marked a little differently about the contralateral hip muscles which are affected. And if you see the uh, blue bars here show the extent of weakness. And they found that the amount of weakness a large extent was on the transverse plane muscles, which is the rotators, internal rotators more than the external rotators, followed by the hip adductors, flexors, extensors, and lastly, the abductors. So this was contrasting to all the evidence which has been posted till now. And in case you see, in fact, the contralateral muscles are much more affected rather than the ipsilateral hip abductors. So this study was a little different in its uh, uh, kind of a... Uh, result. Uh, we did our own study in Sancheti where we kind of had medial uh, knee OA patients with genuvarum and normal alignment and we kind of compared it to see whether the hip abductor strength and the cordyceps strength differed in uh, both. Uh, we, this was our uh, demographics where we had 38 with normal alignment and 68 with genuvarum and uh, we measured the uh, genuvarum uh, on weight-bearing x-rays where 180 degrees was supposed to be 180 to 187 actually is considered the, the, the neutral alignment and anything less than 180 is considered a varus knee. Uh, the measurement for the strength was done by a micro FET3 handheld dynamometer 
uh, which was normalized to body weight. So it was expressed in Newton meter per kg. And what we found out was that, uh, of course, that the varum knees, both OA knee, all were OA patients, but the varum knees were significantly weaker, not only in hip abductor strength, but of course, also the quadriceps strength. And we found a weak positive correlation such that uh, as the angle of the knee was approaching 180 or towards neutral, we saw that the strength improvements were there. So as they kind of regressed or rather in case it was going more towards the genuvarum range, uh, we saw that the strength was declining. Uh, the key points that we observed is there is moderate evidence for weakness in hip abductors, uh, followed by the other muscles which have low to moderate evidence. One very interesting study done by Callahan showed that the isokinetic strength measurements of the hip muscles in normal healthy show that the hip extensors are the strongest, followed by the flexors, adductors and then abductors. And internal rotators are usually stronger than the external rotators. Whereas the isokinetic strength, which was measured in knee OA patients by Costa et al., showed that the hip flexors were the strongest. And this could be because of the altered hip and knee mechanics, which even Joe has shown that even though the hip extension or rather the knee extension was present completely, the patients were usually walking with a mild knee flexion. And that would mean also that the hip was more flexed. Uh, the isokinetic strength assessments, which was done in that 2019 study by Warbeckin, showed a large extent of strength deficits in the hip rotators. So basically, hip strength reductions or deficits are plainly seen in knee OA patients, and the assessment and strengthening should be considered in OA knees. Uh, however, the association between hip, hip strength deficits and development of OA is currently unknown is basically the chicken and egg, whether the hip strength came, uh, deficit came first or the knee uh, OA development came first. So it's just a little uh, conflicting evidence so far about that, or rather the evidence is not yet strong. These are my references and uh, yeah, the hips don't lie. So that's that, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sona, uh, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, my question to you is, uh, is chicken and egg, but if you already have the OA, you already have mild to moderate OA, then does every patient require a screening of hip abductors, uh, not abductors just, but hip muscle musculature, both on the ipsilateral and contralateral side and strengthening uh, as a home exercise program so Definitely. that, so that, uh, at least the disease progression is avoided. Yes, I think uh, it should. In fact, as you we just mentioned earlier, it's basically that our role is more in grade one and two OA so that we can delay the progression of the disease, prevent joint replacements from happening. So I guess we have to play a major role. And as we know that the whole lower limb uh, kind of works like an entire kinetic chain. Uh, so just concentrating on one joint. In fact, if you see... Uh, the isokinetic study which was done, they also showed a lot of plant, I mean, ankle muscles, the inverters as well as the everters which had weakened and plantar flexors which had weakened uh, apart from the hip muscles. So the deficits were much more than hip abductors in fact. So I guess the entire lower limb operates as a kinetic chain and uh, when the person defers weight bearing on that limb, he affects the entire kinetic chain of that side, surely so. So... You know, there's, there's this, I'm in that age group now. I'm about to be Medicare patient soon. Uh, you know, I will be six, uh, you know, Joe has already given up my age, so I can say that. For efficiency of exercises, meaning to finish everything in time, we always talk about this. Are there, do you have like three favorite exercises that, that you say, okay, these are my go-to and this is what is going to get you better? Okay, what so, would you recommend a patient, a therapist? You know, because patients get, I'm a patient myself, and sometimes I get bored with advice. I don't want to be a therapy patient for the rest of my life. So what can I, what, what does a mess, take home message to a patient is from Dr. Sona saying, you need to do this uh, for the rest of your life or as long as you want to be active. What would that be? So this, I can just answer it with a couple of slides. So basically, 
this was a study which was done on electromyographic analysis of the hip rehab exercises in a group of healthy subjects actually in and published in jos pt and in case they kind of kind of recommended that you can start with low intensity exercises which are non weight bearing in which uh, the affected hip uh, if you see you know is on top uh, in sideline as well as in standing we have the uh, limb which is abducted uh, as the affected hip and as the patient improves you can actually have the affected hip to be weight bearing and in case you see this there's a lateral step down or even just kind of lowering the pelvis with the feet off the step it will kind of sorry load the hip abductors sufficiently to kind of uh, strengthen them and you, in fact you can even do the standing hip abduction with the affected limb now doing the weight bearing and the unaffected doing the abduction so i mean you can kind of start with uh, without teraband and progress with you know short lever and long lever arm of terabands uh, there are multiple positions i think uh, sir also likes this fire hydrant exercise if i'm not mistaken as one of the favorite exercises and lateral step down of course and uh, you see this lady here with a teraband around the uh, ankle and uh, this is called a monster walk so the person just walks ahead with uh, placing each leg into abduction as she goes ahead you know so they are, and of course the new kids on the block at least for uh, india is going to be nmes and the bfrt uh, which is again a way forward for strengthening the muscles uh, without uh, especially when the patient is not able to do his effort uh, to the maximum thank you very much uh, that was wonderful Uh, this is an exciting opportunity for both a uh, practicing physiotherapist as well as uh, graduating or masters level students in musculoskeletal medicine uh, to get a comprehensive hands on workshop uh, to register for the course uh, easiest way is to just email us at alld.pune p u n e at gmail.com uh, once again uh, uh, it's a exciting opportunity uh, of hands on course uh, all day long four days with post test uh, and i hope to uh, see you all there thank you